Guys, we still have a full day in front of us. We still got a lot to do and a lot to hear and a lot to experience. So I want to encourage you to continue today leaning in and to continue listening to God and asking what he wants to say to you, asking him to continually reveal Jesus and his will to you for the rest of this day. Got a lot left. But tomorrow, tomorrow we pack up our bags and we load up the vans and then we go home. And then what? What comes next? What's the next and then? Last summer, I, I was asked to do this wedding for a former student of mine in Austin, Texas. And, and Austin is about an eight-hour drive away from where we live there in Stillwater. And in the weeks leading up to uh, that wedding, my wife got online and started doing some research. And she realized that, um, that, that Galveston, which is this little beach town there in Texas, is only about a three-hour drive from Austin. And, and my wife loves the beach. Um, she absolutely loves it. And our kids had never been to the beach before. So she comes to me and she's like, babe, we're, we're that close. If we're going to drive eight hours, we're going to be that close. We may as well drive three more and just go hang out at the beach for a few days. And so she talked me into it. And so we started making plans. Um, we booked this hotel just a couple blocks away from the beach. And, and when the time came, we went down, spent a couple days in Austin doing the wedding stuff. And then we loaded up the van and drove the rest of the way down to Galveston. And we had a great time there, had so much fun hanging out on the beach, doing all the things that you do um, when you're at the beach. The kids and I, we played in the waves, um, we built sand castles, we went looking for seashells, all of those things. And it was, it was a great time, a really good time together as a family. But there was this one thing, this one frustration that I had to deal with there, this one question actually, that my kids kept asking me over and over again the whole time we were there. And if you've ever, um, if you're parents and you've ever gone on a vacation and stayed in a hotel with your kids, you might know what this question is. You may have been asked it before. The whole time we're hanging out out there on the beach having a good time, my kids keep asking me this question, Dad, when can we go back to the hotel and play in the swimming pool? And in my mind, I'm thinking, seriously? Did we... We just drove 11 stinking hours. We, we, we just paid all this money for a hotel and for gas and for food so that you could come to the ocean for the very first time to do something you've never done before. And all you want to do is go back and play in a swimming pool. Like we, we, have, we have a swimming pool in our neighborhood back home. Like we could have just, if you wanted to play in a swimming pool, we, we could have just walked around the block and saved me a lot of time and money. But no, here we are hanging out on the beach. And they love the ocean. And, and it was fun. And they, they had a great time. But here we are standing in front of this big, beautiful, amazing ocean. And all my kids can think about is playing in a little swimming pool. The disciples are like that sometimes. Peter is like that sometimes. We're in Acts chapter 1 today. And for those of you who uh, don't know, Acts is basically the gospel of Luke part 2. So in Luke's gospel, he tells all about Jesus and his life and ministry, all the things he did while he was here on earth. And then in Acts, what Luke does is he tells how Jesus continues his ministry through his church, how those early followers went and did the work of Jesus from there. It's kind of the birth and the story of the early church. And Acts 1 picks up basically right where Luke left off. There's a couple things that Luke tells us in Acts 1. The first thing he tells us is that those resurrection appearances that we see in the Gospels, in the upper room and on the beach and those things, that those weren't the only ones. That actually over a period of 40 days, Jesus continually appeared to the disciples over and over and over again. And, and Luke says he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive, that it was actually him. It's like Jesus didn't want them to ever look back and go, man, maybe... Maybe we were just seeing things in that upper room. Maybe we just dreamt that whole thing up when we were out there on the beach. No, he wanted them to know for sure, to be able to look back and go, we know it was him. We hung out with him over and over and over again. We know that he is alive. And the other thing Luke tells us is that Jesus actually over those 40 days continued to teach them, specifically about the kingdom. 
but the kingdom of God. And this is important because as we've mentioned to you a couple times this week, the, the Jewish people back then, including the disciples, had their own perspective of what the kingdom was. And the Messiah, they they thought the Messiah, again, was this political military ruler and the kingdom he was going to set up was going to be the physical nation of Israel, that he was going to restore that, that he was going to defeat all of Israel's enemies and and the nation was going to come into this time of prosperity and and the Messiah was going to set his throne up in Jerusalem. And of course, that's going to work out pretty sweet for the disciples because they know the Messiah, right? They've been with Jesus since day one. So when Jesus does this, this is going to be a pretty sweet deal for them. And so they get all excited about it. And and so Jesus continually teaches them that, no, no, that's not what the kingdom is. The kingdom of God is not confined to some physical nation or physical space. The kingdom of God is anywhere where people see and recognize the reign and rule of God, where they submit to him, where they give their lives to him, where they see Jesus for what he is and where they put their faith in him. The kingdom is anywhere that people are loved like they ought to be in the name of Jesus, where righteousness and justice are taking place, where God is being worshiped and and the broken are being taken care of. This is the kingdom of God. And Jesus taught them before his death and resurrection and he spends 40 days teaching them afterwards. And so I think the question that they come up and ask him in verse 6 must have been a pretty frustrating one for him. Here's how it goes. Acts chapter 1 verse 6 says this. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Did you catch it? Did you hear it? They're still thinking Israel. They're still thinking small. They're still thinking the point of all this is to bless their people and their nation and make them great and for it to benefit them. They're, well, they're kind of like my kids, standing in front of the ocean and thinking about a swimming pool. It's, if Jesus is this big and vast and amazing thing, which he is, who Jesus is and what he's about are so Big, so beautiful, so amazing, but so often when the disciples stand there in front of him, all they can see is this little bitty picture of him. All they can see is their own small personal agenda for who he is and what he's about, like standing in front of a beautiful ocean and thinking about a kiddie pool. But here's where I need to be a little bit careful because it can get so easy to take shots at the disciples. I mean, 2,000 years later, hindsight is 2020. We have the benefit of looking back on these things and seeing the big picture. And so it is so common for people, especially preachers, to take shots at the disciples about how dumb they were and how much they missed it. And man, they were such idiots and they were so childish. And, and we love to, to make fun of them and especially Peter. And, and I've done a little bit of that even this week, talking about how foolish they are as though, as though we would have done any better in their situation. In fact, I heard one preacher say that he's convinced that when we all get to heaven, that Peter's going to be waiting there for all of the preachers. And when the preachers come up, he's going to go up to them and he's going to give them a big hug and welcome them into heaven. And then he's going to punch us right in the throat. (laughs) For all the trash we've been talking about him for the last 2,000 years. Because the truth is, we would have been in the same spot we would have responded in many of the same ways that the disciples did in that moment. In fact, there are a whole lot of people who respond to Jesus in the exact same ways today, who come to Jesus with their own little agenda for him. Did you know that there are a whole lot of people who honestly believe that the whole point of this Christianity thing, that the whole main reason that Jesus came was to die on a cross for my sins to save me so I can go to heaven after I die. And so they say the prayer or they drop the rock or they get baptized and they go, hey, Jesus, thank you so much for saving me. I appreciate it. That is so kind of you. Um, I'm going to go over here and kind of live my life now. I'm going to do my thing, but I'll catch up with you when we get to heaven. That is crazy. That's unbiblical and it is so small. Listen, Jesus is not just your own personal ticket into heaven. Jesus is the Lord. He's master. He's king. And and there are a lot of people who honestly believe that that, um, the whole point of this Christianity thing is for Jesus to bless me. 
that, that if I follow him and if I be a good Christian, if I do the things that good Christians do, you know, go to church, pray, read my Bible, if I'll do those things, then Jesus is going to help my life kind of work out in the right way. He's going to bless it so that um, I stay safe when I'm traveling and so that none of my loved ones get sick and, and he's gonna help me be successful and kind of accomplish my dreams, um, help me get into the school I wanna get into. And, and then when those things don't work out, they end up getting angry at God as though he's let them down. And, and listen, I, I'm not trying to tell you that, that Jesus never gives us gifts like that, that he doesn't sometimes bless us with some of those cool things. But if you honestly believe that the whole point of Jesus and the whole point of Christianity is to help your life work out smoothly and help it go easy for you and work out the way you want it to, you did not get that idea from the Bible. It's not in there. It's nowhere around there. Jesus did not come for your own personal benefit. He did not come for your own personal agenda. He came for something so much bigger, so much greater. But here's the good news, is that he wants you to be a part of it. That what he's here for, he's invited you into that. And he invites his disciples into that here. Here's what he says in verse 7. Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority. Which I think what he's saying by that is, that's a stupid question, so let's move on. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, the disciples, when they think kingdom, they're thinking man-made and little, small. But Jesus, when he's talking about the kingdom, he's talking about something that is God-made and that is huge, that is worldwide. And he says, here is what you're going to be doing, disciples. Your job is to take the good news of the king and the kingdom and to bring that to everyone and to invite people into that, to tell them about the one who has conquered death and sin and tell them that everyone who wants to place their faith in him is welcome to be a part of this kingdom. And, and this is actually what Jesus is saying to you, that you are called to do this thing as well. In fact, I've only got two points for you this morning, and the first one is this. Number one, Jesus is calling you to kingdom work. Or to use our word for the day, he's calling you to repeat. He's calling you to do the things that he did while he was here on this earth. He's calling you to share the good news of the gospel of the king and kingdom. He's calling you to live out the kingdom by the way you love people. He's calling you to use your gifts to serve and build up the church. He's calling you to make disciples and help them to grow up into maturity, to care for the broken and the hurting you. He's calling you to kingdom work. Now, before you start clapping, before you start clapping, you should probably hear point number two. Point number two is this. You can't do kingdom work. You're not good. Yeah, yeah I guess, yeah, I don't know. You want to clap for that. Um, <laughs> you are not, here, here's, here's, here's the thing. You're not good enough to. You don't have the ability in you to do kingdom work. And the reason why is because the, the kind of work that Jesus is talking about here is, is a kind of work that transforms lives completely. It's a kind of work that takes people who don't want anything to do with him or don't know anything about him and changes them into the kind of people who want to give their whole lives to Jesus, who want to follow him completely and wholly. And, and that's not the kind of change that takes place by me using really persuasive arguments. That change doesn't take place in people's lives by you doing good deeds for them. It doesn't take place by us getting a bunch of Christians in political office to set up a lot of rules that will help everybody do the right thing. No, no, this kind of transformation can only take place from the inside out. It only happens when a person's heart changes and you don't have the ability to change anybody's hearts. And neither do I. I can't do that. Here's the good news. Jesus isn't expecting you to do that. Jesus knows that you can't do that and so he's made arrangements. You may have heard it there in verse 8. Before he says you're going to be my witnesses, he says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and then you will be my witnesses. What Jesus says is, I am going to place my own presence in you. 
the spirit of the living God, third person of the Trinity, moving in you, enabling you, empowering you to do this work. And he is the one who changes hearts. He is the one as you teach the gospel. He is the one as you do good deeds who has the ability to open up people's hearts and lives to the gospel and to change them. He will go with you to do those things. Hey, I, I don't know what specifically kingdom is, work is going to look like for you. But I know at least three things about it. I know, first of all, that he's calling you to do it now. That he's going to have you start where you are, just like he tells the disciples. Start there in Jerusalem and then make your way out. He wants you to start now to live out the kingdom in your home, in your school, on your football team, or in your marching band. He wants you to begin to do kingdom work now. I also know this, that many times that kingdom work will feel beyond you. It will feel like something that's going to stretch you, that's going to be beyond your comfort zone or more than you would have wanted. But lastly, I know this, that he will give you the ability to do it by his Holy Spirit in you. That he will empower you to do those things. Let's wrap up here with verses 9 through 11. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So here they are having this conversation with Jesus. And I don't know if it really goes like this exactly, but this is kind of the way it reads. This is what it sounds like is they're in the middle of having this conversation, talking back and forth with Jesus, when all of a sudden Jesus just kind of goes like Mary Poppins on him, right? And just starts floating up into the sky. And, and they're sitting there in the middle of talking to him going, wait, what's happening? What are you doing? What are you doing? And Jesus goes up and they're just kind of transfixed trying to figure out what is happening here. We call this the ascension, the ascension of Jesus. Here's my question for you this morning. Why does the ascension happen? Why does he do that? Why, specifically, why does Jesus go up? Here's what I always thought when I was a kid is, is Jesus goes up because that's where heaven is. He's got to get to heaven, Right? And so he goes up and he goes past the clouds and he goes, you know, past the atmosphere and then he's got to travel through space. It takes a little while. And then after he gets to there, he gets finally to heaven, right? But now I know better. Now I know that that's not where heaven is. Heaven is a completely different dimension. It's a different realm altogether. And so Jesus doesn't have to travel up to get there. He could have just kind of transported himself there. So then why does he do it? Why does he ascend? You know Why? Because that's what kings do. Kings ascend to the throne. And that's what Jesus is doing in this moment, ascending to the throne at the right hand of his father. The ascension is a display for his disciples to confirm in them, to help them know who has the ultimate authority and power. As if there might be any doubt after that whole, you know, coming back from the dead thing. If there's anybody who's still wondering who has authority, who has power, the ascension clinches it. It's a way of looking there and going, this one, he was the king, he was the Messiah, he is the Lord, and what he says goes. So we have this phrase that I use around my house sometimes with my kids to kind of remind us all of who's in charge here. I'll say to them, I speak, and they respond back to me, we listen and obey. I'll say, Dad speaks, they say, we listen and obey. Or I'll say, Mom speaks, we listen and obey. And that's essentially what the ascension is saying to the disciples and to us. The king has spoken, we listen and obey. In fact, I kind of want to hear you say that. So I'm going to say, Jesus speaks, and I want to hear you say, we listen and obey. Ready? Jesus speaks, obey. when King Jesus speaks, that's what the ascension says to us. And that's what the angels say to the disciples when they're sitting there looking up into heaven. The angels come to them and say, hey, what are you guys doing here? He gave you your orders. He gave you your instruction. Go back to Jerusalem, wait for the Holy Spirit, and then get to work. And that's the challenge I want to leave you with today. The king has given you your orders. He has given us our commands, but he has also, by his own spirit, given us the ability to do it. 
So let's not go back and waste all our time trying to live out our own petty agendas. Let's not spend all our energy on ourselves. The king has spoken. We listen and obey. Tomorrow we go home and then we repeat. Let me pray to that end for you. Dear Father, you have spoken to us through your word, through your son Jesus, and you continue to do so today. I pray this prayer that by your spirit's power, you would give us in here the ability to listen when you speak to us through your spirit, but also this, that you would help us to know your spirit is at work in us and that we would trust him. I pray that he would do the work right now in our lives to make our hearts ready for this, to give us a passion for the kingdom, but then he would also empower us to go home and live out the kingdom for his glory and for our joy. I ask you that in the name of Jesus, amen.